Hello and welcome to the special interview. Lee Bollinger is not just the University of Columbia president there in the United States. He's also one of America's foremost experts on First Amendment or, or freedom of speech uh, rights. Uh, Dr. Bollinger, thanks so much for speaking with us. Uh, just to start with, you're here on a visit to India. How do you see India ranking in the world when it comes to free speech, which is an issue close to your heart? Well, I think it ranks very high. I mean, it's a democracy, and it has a, enshrined in its constitution a right of freedom of speech. We have a very major recent Supreme Court decision uh, upholding the principle of freedom of speech against uh, attempts to regulate online uh, speech that's uh, offensive or annoying. Uh, and uh, under, I think, international norms as well as under developed norms uh, in the United States and India, that was a really wonderful decision. Um, every society faces challenges on free speech, and there are questions of the sort of limits and uh, sensitivities to religion and uh, blasphemy, questions of defamation, questions of incitement and terrorism. So every society faces that, uh, even the most progressive on freedom of speech and press. And uh, so I'm interested in learning more about how India is thinking about those challenges. But on the whole, I mean, I think of India a very committed society to freedom of speech and press. Uh, you mentioned the judgment on what is called Article 66A yeah. uh, in India, and yet many say that it is just the courts that actually upheld the freedom of speech. The government itself continues to try to regulate it, particularly when it comes to online content. Uh, in this particular case, you had petitioners ranging from young schoolgirls uh, yes. to students uh, who were really taken to task for just simply forwarding a mail. Or, re or liking somebody else's uh, yes, Facebook right. comment. Um, do you really think that as a, uh, it, it, when it's the courts and not the government that is actually upholding those freedom of speech rights that a society is actually free? Well, I mean, that's a very good question. So in the United States, of course, you know, if you just look to that history, it's only been 100 years since the first cases uh, were developed in the United States Supreme Court upholding freedom of speech. So in the United States, even though the First Amendment has been part of the Constitution since the 18th century, the jurisprudence that we rely on today is really only 50 to 100 years old. And it's gone back and forth. So sometimes when the society's been very intolerant, the courts have not upheld free speech. At other times, it's been very strong. You always have a contest between, I think, legislatures, parliaments responding to people's wish to be intolerant or to stop speech. And I think one of the great roles of an independent judiciary or the courts is to be the last standard or standing for great principles like freedom of speech and press. So it doesn't trouble me that India should be facing this kind of parliamentary legislative uh, efforts to restrict speech and courts standing up for the right of free speech and press. Uh, I think that's always going to be the case, and we just have to make sure that the institutions are strong and able to do that. Interesting, you, you say that when society is more intolerant, you think courts, as a result, are more intolerant? Um, well, it's been mixed. Uh, so in the United States, the very first cases on freedom of speech and press were in 1919, and they came out of the World War I experience. And most people don't realize this, but the United States Supreme Court in three very major cases, these are the first ones ever, upheld the convictions of speakers, including a conviction of a person who was a candidate for president, president of the United States, Eugene Debs. And so it was an inauspicious start to freedom of speech and press. Later, the court really developed very high standards for it. And then in the 1950s, in the McCarthy era, the courts again caved in to popular will against speech. It wasn't until the 1960s that the court really took a strong stand in a series of cases. So I think this tension is inevitable, and, and we're never perfect. Uh, but uh, it's, that's, why, that's why people like me can teach courses on this, and, and that's why we you know, struggle with it. In India, there are a range of cases. Right now, a lot of spotlight, international spotlight, on the banning of a BBC documentary right, right. Uh, called India's Daughter. First, tell me your thoughts yeah. on the fact that it was banned and that ban was upheld in the yeah. courts. Well, I, I think um, 
I think that's a mistake. I mean, I think that in the United States, um, I think under uh, international norms, uh, Article 19 of the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, I, I think a, uh, you, you could not make, I think, a good case that this should be allowed to be prohibited. That is, it should be protected speech. So I think that's, uh, that's a mistake. In fact, uh, we, we heard from Mahatma Gandhi's grandson uh, who said a few weeks ago that he would never have asked for it to be banned. Uh, so how do you see the Indian government's decision to ban a documentary about a problem inside India? Would you, would you characterize it as a trend? Would you say that there is, in fact, uh, less of a tolerance for free speech? Well, I don't know enough about Indian society to say it's a trend. I mean, I, I, I can say that I think uh, that's an error, and I hope it would be corrected. Uh, one of the things that we realize over time in democracies is that it's, it's extremely dangerous to ban speech, even speech that's highly troublesome, highly offensive to people, very maybe even hurtful to people, uh, because those laws can be used so variously and can be used, as you mentioned before, with mere students being collected up uh, and prosecuted under uh, this other law. So you have to be extremely protective of speech. That's the basic idea. Um, and some speech can be prohibited, incitement, certain kinds of defamation, fighting words, uh, obscenity. But speech about public issues, I mean, this is the heart of why we are committed to a democracy. And it strikes me that that's what this was about. But the Indian government makes exactly that point, that by allowing a film like this, amongst other objections they had, technical objections, they were essentially giving a platform to extremely sexist speech, bordering on hate speech, uh, and in a sense, that's what, what was putting India in a bad light. Um, so using those objections, how do you respond to that? So under, I think, conventional freedom of speech analysis, uh, it is not permissible for a government to say this speech makes our society look bad. Uh, it hurts the reputation of the society. It is not sufficient for a, a government to be able to say this is um, dangerous speech in the sense that it might make people feel uncomfortable or it might be offensive or it might hurt people's feelings. I mean, that's the kind of rationale that we have long determined is extremely threatening to the basic core idea that the people should be able to discuss public issues, sort out what's good and what's bad, deal with what's offensive and annoying and, and dangerous, and come to a judgment about what the society's policy should be. Finally, what should the way forward be according uh, to you when you look at a country like India where Unbridled free speech is not an option, given the differences, given the religious divides, given the fact uh, that any kind of hate speech does trigger off a response. Uh, what's the way forward for India when it comes to legislating? So I think this is actually a very hard problem. And the United States, in fact, has gone back and forth on this. In 1952, this a court and then the, in Illinois and then the Supreme Court allowed the state of Illinois to ban speech that was racist. But in the late 60s and 70s, that was completely reversed. Neo-Nazis, Ku Klux Klan, speech that is really very, very uh, offensive um, has been protected in American society, even though people from different groups feel highly threatened by that or highly hurt. And the general rationale, again, is we want the people to deal with these kinds of ideas <clears throat> themselves through speech. We don't want the government intervening to try to control what we can hear. In a society that is very, very fragile, where there is a major true risk of eruption of violence between groups, where there's a history of it, it's well established that this is a problem, I think there should be perhaps greater latitude for policies and uh, legislation that prohibit certain forms of speech that may cause violence. It's, it's very delicate. This is one of the problems of the global world, how to figure out what is true in each society. Is there really a threat? 
of ethnic and religious violence as a result of um, offensive speech? Or is this a pretext for trying to do, do other things that the government should not be allowed to do? And that's, I think, one of the great issues of our time. Right. So study the threat before you look uh, to shut free speech down, really. Uh, Dr. Lee Bollinger from Columbia University speaking to us here at The Hindu. I'm Sahasini Heather.